Hello everyone, my name is Cooper Pinnell and I am currently a sophomore at Lafayette College studying mechanical engineering and I'm also a mentor of FRC Team 5000 which is stationed out of Hingham, Massachusetts. And today we're going to be going over how to define the geometry of a four bar intake so that it can actuate properly as you wish. As you can see here, I've mocked up just uh, a rough mock-up of a potential chassis with the wheels, with the bumpers, and as well as the down position of the intake. Uh, the down position of the intake is something that you can figure out through the process of prototyping, 2D sketches, or whatever other method your team wishes to utilize. Once you have this dimension, these, these dimensions, um, you can then find use in this video to figure out things such as how long the linkage arms of your four bar intake should be, where they should be mounted to your chassis, at what angle, uh, as well as if you're going to use a linear actuator or a solenoid, where you're going to want to mount that on the chassis as well as on one of the arms of the linkage, which will be later in the video. So let's go ahead and jump into it. A couple important things about this process to know is that it's really about understanding which dimensions are constraints, which means they're never going to change, uh, which dimensions are going to be free and later constrained, and as well as understanding essentially uh, how each of these pivot points of the intake as well as whatever mount points you have on the chassis are able to move. So for example, if I were to hypothetically make a linkage arm from the pivot of the wheel to the front pivot of the intake, we know that any of the potential locations that this front pivot could end up would be somewhere along this circle. And you're going to be seeing throughout this video, we're going to be drawing a whole bunch of these circles and looking at important features such as where they intersect, how far apart they are, and so on. So once you've modeled the down position of your intake, next thing I'm going to want to do is model the up position of the intake, essentially where you want the intake to end up once it's been actuated into the robot. Now we know from robotics that no part of the robot can be outside the frame perimeter once uh, for starting configuration and, and um, things like that. So in order to make sure that this intake is fully within the robot, we know that the dimension from the, the width of the intake plate here is three inches, and we want to give ourselves a little bit of leeway so that the judges are happy. So I'm going to offset this construction line, which is just defining the, the front edge of the robot, uh, the perimeter essentially. We're going to go ahead and offset that two inches and make that a construction line as well. Next thing we want to do is we know that the distance between these two pivot points is not going to change. It's made out of a solid piece of metal or polycarbonate or whatever you wish to use on your team. So this dimension of six inches is not going to change. So we can go ahead and draw that six inch bar just like that. We can also go ahead and draw the slot which will define the profile of the intake. Like I said, it's three inches wide. And some teams choose to have their intake in a certain or their intake in a certain position when it's actuated. So they may want this thing to be completely vertical. They might want it at some particular angle, or they might not care. It really depends on what the rest of your robot looks like and what you're going to be using it for. For this example, I am going to just define this front pivot point to be all the way forward on the robot. And we're going to let this top pivot point be free for now. So I'm going to go ahead and constrain that. And now you can see it's able to move up and down and also rotate if you wish. Now, we know that in the down position, this pivot is going to be here. And in the up position, it's going to have to be on this point here. So we can define a free point in space. We're not going to yet dimension its distance from the front of the bumper or height off of the chassis. We're just going to let it be completely free for now. But we know that if we draw a circle from this point to the bottom pivot point, that this intake profile in this point is going to fall somewhere along this path of the circle, meaning that this intake would be way up here in sky, which is really, really, really high. So we don't want that. And you can see, as I move this pivot point closer and closer, that circle gets smaller and smaller. And so now, if we put it on the circle, it's going to be at a more reasonable height. So we're going to go ahead and constrain that dimension here to here. And now we can see if we were to mount a linkage arm at this point on one end and the pivot point over here, this is how the intake would roughly actuate, or at least how the bottom pivot point of the intake would rotate along that path. And once again, you can see as we move this around, uh, the intake uh, inward position is going to change its height as well as its angle.
Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and model the second potential linkage arm using the same process. So we're going to create a point completely free in space. We're going to draw a circle from that bottom pivot point to pivot point of the intake. And once again, we know that this, these proof, this, the circle of our linkage arm has to be consent or has to be um, coincident with the pivot points on both the downwards and the upward positions. We can go ahead and once again make these concentric. So now we actually quite easily have a relative idea of what this intake is going to do. We can see that if we were to make a linkage arm from this pivot point to this point here, as well as from this one to this one, and we were to actuate it upwards, we would get something that would look like this. And it's inside the frame perimeter. Uh, everything checks out. It is a little bit high, but perhaps that's what your team's looking for. Perhaps they don't care. We're going to go a, bit, a little bit further and try to really optimize the compactness of this design because maybe you don't want the intake this high in the air for whatever reason. If you have a shooter, we have another mechanism uh, up there. So let's go ahead and delete these. And you can see that by either moving the pivot point down here or by clicking and dragging the circle, um, we can really change uh, how the intake is going to actuate. So let's, for this example, try to move the intake a little bit lower down. So you can see if we drag this point downwards, that's going to lower the intake. If we move it forward, it's also going to manipulate some of the dimensions. So let's go ahead, move it forward, move it down a little bit. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that the point at which we're going to mount these linkage arms is going to be the point that we've defined as the center of the circle. So it might be a little bit difficult to mount the linkage arm all the way down here in the wheelbase. So that might not work for us. We want to get it above. So you can see we can move that around. And now by doing this, we're changing the angle of the intake when it's in the upwards position. Now, a lot of teams like to have their intake vertical. So I'll model something as vertical. This piece right here, make it vertical. And now you can see we actually have a pretty reasonable model where we have both the pivot points are above the chassis line, so it should be relatively easy to mount to the chassis. The intake is a pretty compact factor. This dimension from the ground to the top of the intake is 20 inches, so not too bad. Uh, and everything looks to be shaping up pretty well. Okay, so one issue that I see with this design right now and that your team is going to have to keep in mind is that you don't want uh, any of the linkage arms to go past vertical at any point. And the reason for that is that the intake won't, might not actuate as you wish if you do so. For, so, for example, if this intake were to be in the upper position, we were to try to actuate it to go downwards. Instead of this bottom pivot point rotating to the left along this arc, it might actually rotate to the right along this arc, which would cause the whole thing to slant, to slant um, horizontal and kind of pancake itself, and we don't want that. So we just need to move this bottom pivot point to make sure that is, it is behind the, uh, this bottom pivot point here. So go ahead and do that. Keep on moving our things around until we got something that looks pretty reasonable. So something like that looks to be about good. So now you can see this thing has not gone past vertical along its path. It's just going to swing along this arc. Um, everything looks to be pretty good right here. And because of that, we're going to go ahead and dimension these bottom mount locations. I'm going to dimension them both in the X and the Y direction. Uh, this one might already be defined, actually. Yeah, it is. Perfect. OK, great. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about first, I'm actually going to make these construction lines so you don't get too confused. Next thing I'm going to talk about is how we're going to figure out the geometry to actually actuate this four bar linkage. And in this example, I'm going to be using a linear actuator, which is what our team would usually use. So I'm going to go ahead and model these linkage arms. Uh, one thing that you can see, oops, that's not right. Um, one thing that you can see is that this linkage arm actually intersects the bumper, which would not work. However, the interesting thing about a four-bar linkage is it doesn't matter what what shape the four-bar linkage is. Because the pivot points on either end are going to stay the same distance apart, you can really make it whatever shape 
you wish. And so I, for example, could make it go up like here and then across like that to avoid the bumper, and that would not change um, the way that the intake would actuate. But for this example, I'm just going to keep it a straight line because it's simple. So in the downwards position, it's going to look like this, and in the upwards position, it's going to look like this. And for this example, I'm going to be pulling a linear actuator off of the internet that Andy Mark sells, so it will be rules compliant. It's just this one that I quickly searched up right here. And a couple of the important specifications to take a look at is this, what they call closed length, hole to hole, is 118 millimeters, and that's the distance between the two pivot points of the linear actuator um, when it's fully contracted, as well as the speed of the linear actuator. So you can see they have free speed when there's no load, as well as um, when there is load applied, it's at different speeds. So for example, let's say that we want our intake to actuate in one second. We know that that means that the linear actuator is going to travel 32 millimeters uh, in order for it to actuate in one second, which we can do a simple conversion. 33 is 1.3 inches. And we also know that the length is 118, which is 4.65 roughly. So we're going to use a similar approach here. Um, for this example, we're going to be mounting the linear actuator on the back linkage arm. And we know that the point at which we're going to be mounting the linear actuator onto the arm is not going to change. So for example, if it's three inches from the pivot point up to where we're going to mount the linear actuator, it's going to be the same when it's in the down position and when it's in the up position. And we can simply model that with a circle. I'm not going to dimension the circle yet, yet, just yet, because it might change. And so now we have one mount location for the linear actuator. The other one is going to be somewhere on the chassis. So I'm just going to define a point in space. We'll make it free for now. And we know that the closed length of the linear actuator is 118 millimeters, which was 4.65. So I'm going to go ahead and model that in just by drawing a circle, 4.65 times 2. So the distance between the pivot, between this bottom pivot point and the top here is 4.65 inches. We also said that we know that we're going to want to have this linear actuator actuate 1.3 inches, so that our intake actuates in one second. So we're going to go ahead and offset this 1.3 inches. Now, what's somewhat interesting is that our linear actuator is going to be changing, our, changing its length. So it's essentially going to be jumping from this circle to this circle throughout its path, yet the circle that we defined as where the pivot point is going to be on the intake arm is not going to be changing its dimension. So what has to happen is we need to create an intersection where it's able to jump from one circle to the next while also staying on this circle. And to do that, we can simply do it uh, in fusion with some crafty geometry. So we're going to create a point here. That's going to be our pivot point when the intake is down, and we're also going to make to find a point as a pivot point when the intake is up. And you can see, it once again, it's the same distance um, from its, its pivot point on the chassis. Now, to make sure that we have an intersection here, as well as an intersection that should be at this point here, we can do another constraint, coincident constraint. We're going to make this bottom circle, it doesn't like that, there we go, bottom circle coincident with that point and the top circle coincident with this point. And so now you can kind of see the path of the linear actuator is somewhat modeled, where it's going to be starting at this point down here when the intake is down. It's going to travel along this path until it eventually uh, reaches this point when the intake is up. And everything looks to be pretty good. Now you can also see we are able to have a little bit of manipulation even when we've defined so many things. And so if we just change essentially where we're mounting the, the linear actuator onto the top linkage arm, how far away from the pivot point it's going to be. We're able to change how high off the chassis, the bottom pivot point of the linear actuator is going to be, um, and so on and so forth. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that you want the mount point on the chassis of the linear actuator to either be to the right of both of these two points, or if you're going to put it on the front, then to the left of both of these two points. If you put it in the middle, you're going to have a similar issue I described before with this vertical piece where it's going to kind of pancake itself and not actuate as you wish. Okay, so now that we have that defined, we're going to go ahead and dimension everything so that it's no longer free. So we'll dimension this height 
It will also dimension its distance from the front of the chassis, which apparently is already defined. Perfect. Um, and you can see that that also derives a dimension for um, this circle, which is twice the distance from the pivot point to where you're going to mount your uh, linear actuator onto the back linkage arm. So for example, it's 11.193 divided by 2. So when you start designing the actual linkage arms to be machined or manufactured, we now have that dimension as well as all the other ones that we really need. So let's go ahead and just go over this design real quick and make sure that everything looks okay, which is always a good uh, good engineering principle. So when the intake is down, it's going to be looking like this position right here. We're going to have this as one of the linkage arms and this as the other. Other, We know their distances, so we can simply do a uh, measure and get both of their distances. Uh, 10.92, so on and so forth. So we have those two distances. We have the distance from the front of the robot as well as this um, extrusion tube right here modeled up, dimensioned right there and right there. Uh, we have the angle still what we set it to be. Everything looks good. Then we know that the linear actuator is going to be um, contracted and it's going to look something like this in this position. When we actuate the linear actuator, it's going to travel along this path, expanding, expanding, all the way until it reaches this point. Um, and then the intake is going to be in this position up here, and these are going to be the positions of the linkage arms. This doesn't go past vertical, neither does this one, so we're all set there. It's still within the frame perimeter. It's at a reasonable height, uh, and everything seems to check out. So all that you really need to do from this point is take the essential geometries that we've now found, so the position of the mounting points of your four bar linkage arm, so this dimension, this dimension, this one, whatever it is from here to the front of the chassis. Go ahead and model that into your robot. You don't also want to take the dimensions of these two linkage arms. Um, you're going to want to take the dimension of the pivot point for the linear actuator, as well as write down um, this dimension, which is going to be the closed dimension of the linear actuator as well as the um, open dimension of the linear actuator. Write those down, make sure that whoever is coding it knows how far they have to actuate that linear actuator or if it's a solenoid, it's just one of the two is on off. Um, and this all looks to be pretty good. Thanks for watching. I hope that this instructional video will help your teams when modeling four bar intakes. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about CAD, I have another CAD video on my channel about CAD modeling specifically for first robotic parts in using SOLIDWORKS, as well as how to generate tool paths using Fusion's CAM package if you're going to be using a mill or a router or something of that sort.